But to, to get started on catalysis, so one of the principles of green chemistry, it's way down there at number nine. But there's clearly a lot of benefits that can come from it. And the, the wording of the principle is pretty careful. We'll come back to the selectivity issue in a minute because that's pretty important. So to figure out whether your process is really turning out to be green based on a catalyst or not, you would want to start out looking at the 12 principles. Just kind of go down the list, one through 12. Uh, is the catalyst toxic or not? Is it actually used in sub-stoichiometric -sto amounts? And that, that's a serious consideration because you, you'll find in some of the literature that there are cases where uh, you know, even though the substance is not changed during the course of the reaction, it has to be present in such a large amount that it, it's kind of questionable to really call it a catalyst. That on a, you know, a mass basis, it may actually be more than your reagents. Um, so considering 12 principles related to auxiliaries and special materials, sometimes using a particular catalyst might require uh, that you use a toxic solvent. It might require uh, moisture-free conditions, oxygen-free conditions. All of these things might uh, counteract the, the positive benefits that you're getting. Uh, the principles about abundant renewable resources, you can make catalysts from, from virtually anything. Uh, then what happens at the end of the reaction? Can you reuse it? Can you separate it from the product? That's a really big deal in pharmaceutical chemistry because people taking the drugs don't want to be taking random elements from the periodic table with their medicine. And then it's, it's very common that you can add a catalyst to a reaction and it might, might be too good of a catalyst. It might go uncontrollably, generate heat, uh, generate product too quickly. Um, we'll come back to that in, later in the semester when we talk about chemical accidents. But you have to ask all these questions. And then applying these at different parts of the life cycle. So you almost have to consider the catalyst itself as a, a chemical product that you would, you would think of um, ordinarily. So again, going through the life cycle, raw materials, manufacturing, use, and end of life. So when we consider the raw materials, we, we've talked a lot about whether carbon comes from hydrocarbons, petroleum fractions. but also thinking about metals, because virtually anything in the periodic table can be used in, in catalysts. So if you look at a chart of here, all the elements are, are lined up in order from lowest atomic number. So here's hydrogen and lithium all the way up to the, uh, the higher. These are the 90s, so uranium up in 92. And you see this sort of general trend that as you get heavier and heavier, that the abundance goes down quite a lot. And this is a logarithmic scale, so there's a difference of at least nine or 10 orders of magnitude between something like aluminum and say rhodium or palladium or osmium. And so when you do have a choice in a catalytic system, it maybe doesn't always make sense to use something that's only produced on the scale of, I don't know, a ton per year, whereas something like um, you know, copper or cobalt, these tend to be produced on the scale of gigatons per year. So the, the impacts of choosing a particular element to be in your catalyst are pretty far reaching. And some work that came out of the forestry school here at Yale, uh, out of Tom Gradle's group, this, this publication just came out this year. Uh, they did a study on whether certain elements have good substitutes available. And the reason for this is a lot of metals have restrictions on the supply chains. There, there's vulnerabilities to supplies, either for political reasons, because certain countries control access, or just abundant, reasons of abundance, that there's not a lot of the stuff in the ground to begin with. And it turns out for, for many elements, these ones that are, that are red, uh, there's, there's not any other, well, right now at least, there's not any other uh, element or technology that can replace the use of these metals. So what that means is if you're tasked with coming up with a new catalyst, you might say, OK, I have this great manganese catalyst that I want to use to do biomass conversion. I'm going to make all this uh, useful chemical building block from a renewable resource. But if right now manganese is being used in some other application that can't be substituted, then you have to think about, is it pulling it away from something that's really critical? Or you could also use this as the flip side to say, all right, well, why is, why is rhodium so poor in terms of the available substitutes, and that might be a good, re a good area to focus research attention. Um, and the interesting thing that uh, also coming out of Gradle's work is that virtually all of these elements tend to get used almost in combination. So something like an iPhone has, uh, what is it, like 90 or 100 different mm -hmm. elements in it. Yep. 
So the, um, it, it's pretty common that you find technologies that are hitting a lot of these red boxes, and then you have to start asking these questions about prior priority. Does, do we need to have uh, you know, europium in our smartphone, or do we need to be saving that europium for some other you know, medical use or water treatment type of use? So going along the life cycle, you could think about manufacturing of the, the catalyst itself. So the catalyst doesn't usually does not just magically come out of the ground or off of a tree or something. Uh, a lot of catalysts have very complicated syntheses, so they take energy to, to do the chemical reactions. There's waste that's associated with those different reaction steps. And then you have to consider the toxicity of the other materials that are going in to, to build the catalyst. And then in terms of the use phase, when you're actually applying the catalyst, so we talked about selectivity. Is it giving you a, a good set of products that you want? And then you'll see these numbers come up over and over again in the literature, and we'll talk about these in the coming classes as well. These are basically metrics on the catalyst performance. So the, the first one I think is pretty, uh, pretty intuitive. It's just how much product you can make per mole of catalyst. So that's, this is the key number that's going to tell you about whether you're sub-stoichiometric or not. And then adding a time dimension, so basically the same thing, moles of product per mole of catalyst per second. And you'll see there's, you can hit the full spectrum. So there's really terrible catalysts that could do one turnover per day. And there's really amazing catalysts. I think the record for synthetic catalysts are the ones that are used in polymer synthesis. So converting ethene to polyethylene, these catalysts can do millions of turnovers per hour. And then Along these lines, you have to think about safety. Sometimes there are cases where doing millions of turnovers in an hour might be generating dangerous pressure or dangerous temperature. So all these things have to be taken into consideration. And then end of life, I already mentioned the pharmaceutical issues, but just in general, can you reuse the catalyst and can you separate it from product mixture? Uh, it, it can be very difficult, especially if your, um, your catalyst has a very small particle size. and we're starting to see some innovations in things like attaching catalysts to magnetic beads. So here's a, a photo of a chemical reaction. The catalyst is all dispersed in the solution, and it's probably too small so that you wouldn't be able to filter this very effectively. But by applying the magnet here, they've caused all the catalyst to lump up on the side there, and then you can just sort of pour off your, your uh, product mixture. <coughs> 